in everyone uh, who is here. here. Uh, I want to start by thanking everyone who is here, um, especially our guests who come from far away. Marilena Felinto has had to travel countless hours because of some of the disruptions that were um, happening this week in Brazil. We'll hear more about that. So we are particularly thankful to her for being here, but also to all of you for, for being here. And to Kathy Birch and Ana Gabriela Jimenez, who have worked very hard to put this event together, together with our affiliated faculty, a member of our advisory board, Sika Nunes, uh, who is who introduced, introduced, introduced us, sorry, uh, to Marilene Felinto uh, first, um, who is now a class affiliated um, distinguished Latin American scholar uh, during the month of November here, here with us. I also want to take this opportunity to thank our uh, postdoctoral fellow and visiting scholars with Klaus and Africana Studies and Marie Villette uh, for her am amazing contributions to our center, including the invitation to Magda Gomez to this panel. Magda will be joining us um, uh, on this. Um, I also will take this opportunity to let you know while well, we get um, all the technology set up, that um, we have more outstanding programming on Brazil happening this month. We'll have a film screening followed by a discussion with Cheryl Barber um, about her film, I, Black Woman Resist, about the legacy of civil and political rights activist, Marielle Franco. This will be um, on November 9th at 3.30 p.m. We also want to invite you to a talk entitled Democracy, Black Feminism, and Social Transformation in Brazil, which will take place on November 10th at noon with Angela Figueiredo of the um, Universidad Federal de uh, Reconcavo da Bahia in Brazil. So uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce our guests. I'm going to do so in alphabetical order. So I will start with Marilene Felinto. Marilene, as I um, briefly mentioned before, she's the 22-23 uh, Center for Latin American and Latinx Studies Distinguished Visiting Scholar. She was born in the city of Recife in the Northeast uh, of Brazil, but she was raised in Sao Paulo, um, starting at the age of 11. Marilene is an award-winning fiction writer with the most important prize in Brazilian literature, literature, sorry, the Jabuti Prize, uh, in the author revelation category for her novel, As Mulheres do Tichu uh, I should have uh, memorized that, I apologize. Uh, which is a novel, a novel from um, 1983. The novel is translated into English, French, Dutch, and Catalan. This is just one of many publications that Marilene has written, including novels, short stories, articles, and essay, essay collections. Um, her most recent one being Mulier <coughs> Baker. Marilene is also a translator for English to Portuguese, and she has translated work, works by Virginia Woolf, Joseph Conrad, Edgar Allan Poe, Ralph Ellison, and Hilton Alves, among others. She's a journalist currently writing as a columnist for the highly rewarded Brazilian daily newspaper, Folia de Sao Paulo. Benito, formerly a visiting writer in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of California at Berkeley, <clears throat> uh, has also been a lecturer for several other American and European institutions. We are really thrilled to have her uh, here with us for the month of November and to keep off her visit with this event. On the screen, uh, we have Magda Gomez. Hi, Magda. Um, Magda is a project manager, yeah. a student of civil engineering, and parliamentary advisor for strategic planning in the city of Rio de Janeiro. 
Magda Gomez is the co-founder of the Ghetto Institute, a nonprofit based in Rio de Janeiro that others that offers sorry uh, training and opportunities to equip Black entrepreneurs with technological, business, language, and other skills. According to a recent Forbes article, the institute has established a vast network of customers, specialized knowledge, and other forms of capital for new entrepreneurs. Magda Gomez is also the leader of Rosinia Resiste, a large community collective that has successfully collected and, uh, and distributed food and personal protection materials during the pandemic and improved schools and health centers. Magda was recently recognized in Brazil for her efforts in mitigating the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in her community. Um, and last but certainly not least, our own Melissa Tejeira, who is assistant professor of history here in the University of Pennsylvania. She's a historian of modern Brazil and Latin America, with particular focus on the economic and legal histories of the region, among other research interests. Her current book project is The South Atlantic Economic Lives, Remaking Capitalism and Citizenship in 20th Century Brazil, which is explores Brazil's response to the political, economic, and social crisis of capitalism following the Great Depression. Melissa received a PhD in history from Princeton University, an MPhil in economic and social history from the University of Cambridge, and a BA in history and economics from the University of Pennsylvania, summa cum laude. So she's always back. Uh, prior to her arrival to Penn, uh, Melissa was a postdoctoral prize fellow and in economics, history, and politics at Harvard University. And she has also been an active participant in our class community since she first arrived at Penn, for which we are truly uh, thankful um, and, and very, very fortunate. So uh, what we are going to do now, and before I do this, I want to make sure with the interpreters that they can hear as well in order to do the interpretation. Uh, is that confirmed? Yes, but just speak closer into the mic. Okay, so okay, so we'll... we'll, we'll Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Yeah. So um, we'll keep that in mind. Um, so what what we'll do uh, now is um, each of our presenters will start with some brief remarks, uh, or not so brief. Uh, we told them up to fifteen minutes. Um, uh, but we also have questions prepared to start the conversation, and then we will we'll open it up to the to the audience. And Magda, if you prefer uh, that we jump into questions, we can also do that. You know, it's it's uh, it, it, it's a little bit up to you. Okay, so without further ado, Marilene will speak uh, uh, first. Uh, I would suggest we go in in alphabetical order. If that's okay with you, Melissa, we'll do uh, Magda next, and then Melissa. Is it okay here? Can you hear me? Uh, I think this is here. Yeah, it's like the main Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. I want to thank the University of Pennsylvania and the Center for Latin America. Left studies in the name of Tulia Paletti for inviting me here as a visiting scholar. And thanks especially to Professor Zita Nunes, to whom I, I am very grateful for, the, for her interest in Brazil and in my work. I also want to thank Professor Catherine Bach for all the attention and kindness with which she made so many arrangements for my coming and staying here for months. And also Anna works with her and Zita again. Thank you so much. Without you three, I would be nobody here. And uh, I apologize here, first of all, for my uh, for my eventual mispronunciation and other mistakes of my English. They're gonna happen here. Before coming here, I prepared this speech one way, but then I had to change it a little in the last minute because of the fascist riots 
which keep on threatening a coup, a political coup in Brazil. And that began on Monday, one day after the victory of New Life. My trip to Philadelphia was very much affected by those riots. I left Sao Paulo where I live on Tuesday morning, having to flee from the blockings of avenues, roads, and highways that fanatic supporters of Bolsonaro have set up all over the country. One of the road laws prevented access to the international airport. Lots of flights were canceled or delayed, so I had to leave home 10 hours before my flight, fearing to be stuck on the highway. The situation now seems to be more or less under control. Of the, 900, of the 954 blocks across the country, only about 15 were partially active today. And if blockages have not yet been fully undone, it is because during his administration, Bolsonaro has co-opted part of the police forces in his favor. Even in, in the military police and the federal police in charge of ending the blockades, there was resistance to put an end to them. I left Brazil very worried about these events, but some political analysts in Brazil are expressing optimistic points of view on the defeat of the Bolsonaro project. Psychoanalyst Leonardo Goldberg, for instance, thinks that after the defeat in the election, Bolsonarism, Bolsonarism or Bolsonaro, you know, will, <laughs> this exists in English, will fade away and be extinguished. And he points out the fact that Bolsonarism is not something new in Brazilian history. What makes it a particular current in the far right political history is first, neo Pentecostalism co opted by political parties, the promise of collective prosperity that gives a disruptive guise to the movement, and personalism around the messianic figure of Bolsonaro. He says the novelty here is the direct relationship with the divine and the excess of certainty in the Bolsonarism way of thinking. Although the religion's appeal was constantly present in Brazilian political history, Goldberg compares the rise and possible fall of Bolsonarism to the Islamic State and the impregnation of what he calls the structure of, of certainty in the movement. He says Bolsonarism follows the same historical path as the Islamic State. Its, its uh, vertiginous growth and political power were precisely due to, the, due to the exclusion of uncertainty in action. As they never had lost the battle, their followers did not think before joining the raging ranks of expansion that quickly created a caliphate in and around Syria. This is where the question comes, comes in, according to Goldberg. Its greatest, its greatest strength was at the same time its, weak, its weakest point. Any loss would throw its structure to a point of untenable contradiction. Goldberg mentions the period of the COVID-19 when in Brazil, the Bolsonaro government could not admit a stop and embark on doubt. The, uh, he says that Bolsonaro government already had all the answers to the epidemic. The new world order, globalism, the media, and lastly, chloroquine. And, and he finally says only a theology of certainty could sustain this brutality. Other political scientists like Maria Mina Tavares ponder that the coup movement is not at all spontaneous and that it was not unexpected. It grew up in parallel Brazil, she says, where its leaders and participants live, broken by repeated speeches against electoral institutions and the demonization of opponents who would promote the communization of the country. What warranted respect, respect for democracy, says the vice, was also a sequence of gestures that followed the official announcement of the election results. Among them, she mentions the immediate support to Lula abroad by the American Joe Biden and the French Emmanuel Macron, for instance, 
who headed the extensive list of national leaders who hastened to, uh, to hail Lula's triumph. And also international rejoicing merged with relief from the national media that democracy had, after all, prevailed. As for Lula's victory in the social context in Brazil, on the one hand, it was a victory of poverty against wealth, from my point of view. And on the other hand, of the democratic desire of part of the people against the fascist wave that threatened to settle, to settle in the country for another four years. A simple look at the map of the election results is enough to understand that it was the poorest regions of Brazil, the north, the northeast, and the north of the state of Minas Gerais that gave Lula the victory. Much is being said about Brazil being a divided nation today. Politically, this became evident and more evident. Even though Lula himself has said in his speech to the people shortly after his election that there are not two Brazis. But one cannot forget that as far as the class struggle is concerned, the country has always been divided. It is well known that Brazil is among the 10 most unequal countries in the world, a social gap that greatly diminished during the Lula and Dilma administrations from 2003 to 2016. When it comes to income concentration in the world, Brazil ranks second among 180 countries just behind Qatar in terms of income hold by the, rich, the richest 1% of the population, which in the case of Brazil holds a third of the total income. Very recent analysis show that from January 2019, when the government of Jair Bolsonaro began, until September this year, 2022, the number of people living in extreme poverty increased by 10 million. Today, we have 49 million Brazilians who do not have enough income to survive and need government assistance. Of course, Lula's victory was also a victory of the large progressive urban centers like Sao Paulo, the capital of the state of Sao Paulo, and its metropolitan region, which gave Lula the victory. Sao Paulo and its surrounding municipalities together make up the most populous metropolitan region in the country with 2,000, uh, sorry, 21,900,000 inhabitants. Therefore, supported by a large urban center like Sao Paulo, Lula's victory also means the affirmation of the desire of half of our society to have back in the country a policy of social justice, a policy of combating inequality, of repudiating racism, homophobia, misogyny, violence and terror. It means that there is absolute rejection of a state, of a state policy that spent four years encouraging the extermination of the different, the poorest, the black people, the indigenous people, our native peoples. A state policy that violated and destroyed territories of nature that need to be preserved for the future of Brazil and the world. It was a victory of uh, the repudiation of what Akili Mbembe calls liberal-politics. It is uh, Bolsonaro's ideology, is the ideology of hatred, of disdain for the truth, of diffusion of lies, of manipulation of information and reality. It was this violence that killed almost 700,000 Brazilians in the two years of the COVID epidemic. Brazilians and the world wonder what implications the election result will have on democracy in Brazil. According to the analysis of one of the most important thinkers of the Brazilian political left today, the philosopher and political scientist Marilena Chauvin, the only way to think of an economic and restructuring plan for the country is that the leftist political groups work together. She says, it is necessary to recover a proposal against the neoliberal economy and propose some points of action to prevent the opposition to the Lula government from sabotaging the country's social reorganization. Lula's victory, based on a broad political front and not just on one political party, is the first step in this direction. And it will prevent the continuity 
of an extreme right-wing model on the South American continent. In his first speech after the result, Lula himself said that the integration of South America is back to the world. I'm just finishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. The first point, uh, according to Marilena Shawit, to restructure the country is to recover the role of the public fund and directed to meet social rights so that it guarantees these rights again. The second point is to resume what was fundamental, uh, what was a fundamental way of administering of the previous governments of the Workers' Party under Lula. The national conferences, a great national articulation of public policy proposals in the most diverse areas of government, such as health, education, public security, environment, among others. But Marilena Shawi also warns that the anti-communist uh, agenda has been emptied around the world and that Bolsonaro government has tried to piggyback on Donald Trump's uh, agenda, which, also emptied, uh, which is also emptied uh, today. The dismantling of these two perspectives, according to her, makes the extreme right wing move in Brazil towards totalitarianism, mainly through the evangelical churches who take advantage of the working class, take poverty for themselves, and prevent an organization of the social race. And Marina Shawi also fears that, uh, also fears what could happen until January 1st, 2023. When Lula, when Lula takes office. It's not just the threat of a coup, but also the possibility of Lula's assassination, in her words. Lula's victory is the only chance we have to remake the country. On the one hand, it represents a social and political demand to find a barrier to the extreme right and the barbarism of neo neoliberalism. On the other hand, it meets expectations of many in Latin America and the world that, as historian Vijay Prashad has recently commented, some of the alignment that Lula managed to give the BRICS, for example, when he was in power, would be captured by issues of global interest, led by someone like this unique statesman, statesman that Lula is, who has legitimacy and respect, and respect throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilene. Um, we'll move to Magda Gomez. Um, Magda, can you hear us? Um, if you will unsing um, perfectamente. So, um, I hope uh, you know so. Can you see this? Unmute. Okay, uh, great. Um, so now, Magda, would you like to make some remarks? No, não traduziu para mim. Some introductory remarks before we ask our questions. Não, é, eu faço, tenho muito acordo com, com o que foi dito, é, especificamente pela preocupação que se tem quando se trata também aqui das favelas do Rio de Janeiro. Então, perfeito, excelente. Ok, um, okay so, Magda, if you don't want to intervene now, We'll save some questions for you later. Is that okay? I, I think she just didn't get that she had to present now. That's okay, okay. So so then we'll save for questions later, right? She has a presentation. Oh she has a presentation. Yes, she does. Okay, so then can, can I you just can you speak um, in the mic? Thank you so much. Sorry. Magda, pode falar, fazer a sua apresentação agora. Ah, sim. <risos> ok, obrigada. Porque eu recebi... Gente, é, boa tarde. Primeiro, eu quero agradecer imensamente é, a organização 
e a possibilidade de estar aqui trocando com vocês tudo que eu penso sobre esse processo eleitoral e, sobretudo, o que significa a vitória do Lula, especialmente para mim, que sou uma mulher preta, favelada, que nasci na favela da Rocinha e cresci num ambiente em que, desde cedo, para mim, conceitos como democracia, partilha e responsabilidade civil e coletiva sempre foram coisas... É que me nortearam, né? norteiam a minha essência. Eu, como muitas das brasileiras e brasileiras desse país, sou uma das primeiras a entrar na universidade, a partir das políticas de cota, ProUni, FIES, que me possibilitou pensar para além dos muros da universidade, como transpor a sabedoria e a vivência dada pela minha avó, pela minha família, que até então não tinham entrado na universidade, é, refletindo e traduzindo tecnologias do meu território, da minha comunidade, fazendo uma conciliação com o que se é estudado e pensado na academia, que muito se tem desses territórios. Então, muito prazer estar aqui com vocês. Para mim, é muito importante que a gente faça esse debate profundo, faça esse debate sobre democracia, sobre o Brasil, sobre as eleições e como tudo isso é importante para nós. Acho que a eleição do Brasil, a garantia da democracia no Brasil, sobretudo o fortalecimento dela, da importância da América Latina, não é uma questão apenas é, do Brasil, né? é uma questão do mundo. O Brasil, com as dimensões populacionais e geográficas que tem, é importante resguardar e proteger a democracia desse país. Ok, so now we can move to Melissa Teixeira. Um, would you like to use that one, which is not as Thank you so much. But make sure that this is on. Sorry. 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 Sorry.
of Brazil's political system. And so I think, you know, some of the questions linger in terms of why um, the appeal of military or authoritarian political voices um, has, um, is appearing again right now uh, in Brazil, uh, as well as the differences between what we see in 2022 uh, and what we saw in 1964. Um, with that in mind, I think it's important to emphasize the many, many ways in which Lula's victory is historic. Um, historic because he will be the, the first to serve three democratically elected terms in office. Historic also because Lula has won the largest number of votes cast in Brazil's history with 60.3 million votes for him. Um, certainly the results on Sunday was razor thin with Bolsonaro and Lula coming within two points of one another, um, which again speaks to how polarized Brazil is currently uh, and the Herculean task that Lula will face in governing in the next couple of months um, and years ahead. Uh, but even with this really tight margin between Lula and Bolsonaro, it's important to, to keep in mind that Lula received more votes than any previous candidate in Brazil's history and that more people voted in the second round in Brazil than in the first round, um, which is not typically the case um, in runoff elections in Brazil. And the number of ballots cast, uh, the number of blank ballots cast in Brazil was lower uh, than in previous elections. So while Lula's victory was not a landslide, I do think it was decisive. Um, um, it was decisive uh, in terms of how it really depended on and benefited from uh, grassroots, grassroots mobilizations in Brazil, pro-democracy movements in Brazil that Lula, uh, that very much were responsible for, for Lula's victory, but also a victory that in many ways built off uh, of Lula's legacy, uh, a legacy that he's been building over the past 50 years, um, and that has earned Lula the support and, and affection uh, of millions uh, in Brazil. Um, a legacy that has uh, and will certainly be tested over the next four years as Brazil confronts mounting economic challenges, um, many of the same economic challenges that nations are facing worldwide. Um, so in thinking now, I think about just to kind of conclude briefly, um, I think in terms of the legacy and the kind of historic nature of Lula's victory, there are two um, primary pillars which I might want to signal uh, right now, and then we can again open up to a, a broader conversation about this. First, I think it's the legacy of, of how Lula has really, across his career, been at the forefront of pro-democracy movements in Brazil. Uh, thinking about Lula's trajectory uh, as a political figure starting in the late, in, in the 1970s, uh, when he was elected president to uh, the steel workers sindicato or, or kind of trade union in Sao Paulo, and how he worked in the 1970s to advocate for workers' rights, to advocate uh, for higher salaries and, way, and better working conditions in the face of mounting inflation in Brazil in the 1970s, and how his role as a kind of lead, uh, a labor leader really launched him into national and, and international uh, into national and international um, kind of conversations um, and how from that position he in the 1980s was really at the forefront of pro-democracy movements in Brazil in helping Brazil transition away from 20 years of military dictatorship uh, as it was working to build a new democracy. Lula was at the forefront of the 1984 Direita Já protests uh, in Brazil that called for immediate and direct presidential presidential elections, for example, to end, again, 20 years of military rule. Um, and so I think it's really fitting uh, and really quite remarkable that, again, Lula is going to be the person who is trying to guide Brazil through uh, another moment uh, in which Brazil's democratic institutions have been 
question and challenge um, with the way in which Bolsonaro has really tried to discredit the credibility of Brazil's uh, democratic system, its integrity, and also the ways in which uh, Bolsonaro very much um, antagonized, uh, Bolsonaro and supported very much antagonized uh, the group, the social movements, the pro-democracy movements, the grassroots movements, who have been um, they're fighting for the continuity uh, and expansion of social justice, racial justice in Brazil, even during the, the Bolsonaro uh, administration. And so in thinking about uh, Lula's role in, in Brazil as being at the head of pro-democracy movements, as shaping the, the direction of Brazil's democracy during that first transition out of military rule, uh, I think it's really quite remarkable that he finds himself in that position again, and it'll be a question of thinking about what his legacy might be this time around. On that point, um, I think we already have very strong examples from Lula's first two terms in office as to what he might focus on, the way in which from 2002 to 2010, Lula's uh, government really um, focused on the expansion of social programs, the poverty alleviation programs through um, state-funded programs like Bolsa Familia or Fomi de Ejo that were remarkable in terms of poverty reduction in Brazil, in terms of um, ensuring greater access to health care for millions of Brazil, especially for among Brazil's <clears throat> poorest families. Um, and I think in many ways, there's a lot um, that we've heard from Lula already to think about how he's going to try to continue uh, to expand that legacy, uh, his legacy in terms of being an advocate for social programs. Um, and these social programs like something like Bolsa Familia were really quite remarkable, not only in terms of relief, again, for some of Brazil's poorest households, but also uh, for the ways in which they were really indexed towards long-term sustainable social and economic development in Brazil. Uh, something like Bolsa Familia, for example, was not only in essential for encouraging uh, human capital development in Brazil because of the ways in which this conditional cash transfer um, really uh, mandated uh, early childhood that uh, children go to school, vaccination programs, et cetera, but also the ways in which it really kind of generated uh, an important source of ec economic stimulus in, in Brazil for the ways in which the cash transfer uh, cushioned the budgets of some of Brazil's poorest households and really made possible uh, the rise of a new middle class in Brazil, uh, the rise of a new consumer, uh, of a new consumer culture in Brazil that was really essential to Brazil's uh, economic growth in the early 2000s. And so there's a lot in there uh, in his earlier programs uh, that I think he will want to expand upon, continue, uh, and continue not only, again, for the ways in which they were essential for poverty reduction, but also for the ways in which they were really essential for Brazil's economic growth and development uh, in the early 2000s, the way in which Brazil became a beacon, not only for other countries in Latin America as a model, but also for other uh, countries in the global south, uh, the way in which Lula was really keen to turn Brazil into an example of both social justice and economic prosperity. Of course, all that being said, the world today in, in 2022 is very different from the world that uh, Lula first encountered in 2003. The economic situation globally is quite is quite dire, um, and we're seeing evidence of not just in, in Latin America but also worldwide. And I think few would deny that Lula's success in the early 2000s was thanks to the ways in which commodity prices were quite high for Brazil's key key commodity: soy, sugar, coffee, iron. Um, and that right now Brazil faces a lot of um, instability in terms of its economic performance, as well as the way, as well as in terms of Brazil's position in global markets. 
So I think the test will be to see how uh, Lula can adapt his program in more mm -hmm. uncertain economic conditions and the ways in which, uh, and the extent to which he'll be able not just to return Brazil to a political program that again puts questions of social justice and poverty alleviation at the forefront, but whether or not he'll be able to deliver on those progress, on those promises, again, in terms of the economic condition that Brazil finds itself than currently, as well as in terms of the political opposition that he'll face um, in terms of the ways in which Bolsonaro's party and people aligned with Bolsonaro have made important gains in Congress and in important state governments. Um, so there's a lot to be optimistic about uh, with Lula's election uh, and already the ways in which he signals that he wants to continue with uh, expanding social programs that he's already called for special constitutional reform, for example, to allow uh, the continuation of some of the cash transfers that have been really important in, uh, again, uh, among for, from a Brazil support household, uh, but also, again, some uncertainties as to what will happen in the next couple of months and next few years, um, and the ways in which, to what extent Lula will be able to expand upon his legacy. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Melissa. Um, so, what we'll do now, I have many, many questions uh, for our three panelists, but I will start with one question for each of them, and then we'll open it up to uh to the audience um Magda, since um you were the least that the, the, the one that spoke the list i would like to start with you if that's okay um so Magda, you um work in um in marginalized communities neighborhood uh rosinia uh which last time i was in rio was one of the favelas that tourists would be um, uh, visiting, exactly. Be, uh, I was going to say allowed. It, 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 was one, it was one of those that tourists could go visit. But, um, but you know, uh, a, 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 certainly a marginalized population of the city. So I would like to know, um, uh, in your opinion, or, or as you lived it, what was the climate there right before the election? Um, and after the election. I know we had two rounds of election, the first one on October 2nd, the, the second one on October 30th. So, you know, what, what, what was the climate in, 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 your, in your community leading to both of those two rounds? And what have things been like since then? Bom, sim, tem uma uma dinâmica né, social que ela é muito, é muito complexa, sobretudo quando se fala de é, territórios favelados e periféricos. Tem uma, uma dimensão de se entender, de se produzir uma narrativa de que esses espaços são perigosos e inseguros. No entanto, esses espaços são os espaços possíveis para a maioria da população brasileira. Então, é muito importante a gente estar sempre atento a, a reflexões nesse sentido. Né? E aí é, é visível que durante o governo do atual presidente não se foi possível, tanto pelo fomento né, ao turismo, que não havia, e tampouco por esse, é, esse presidente produzir, sobretudo, uma narrativa de que esse espaço é um espaço perigoso e inseguro. No entanto, é, tudo, a maior parte das pessoas que habitam nesses espaços, assim como eu, meus amigos e minha família, são pessoas que fazem desse desse espaço um espaço que é a motriz e a matriz social de um país. É na favela que se geram as tecnologias e as e as urgências necessárias que transformam esse país. Mas antes de tudo, é preciso pensar em como as favelas e a periferia, elas são é, termômetros para a democracia. É por isso que nesses lugares se constrói políticas importantes que movem o país. 
A Rocinha, por exemplo, ela tem cerca de 150 mil habitantes. 70% dos moradores votaram no Lula. O que isso significa dizer? Significa dizer que há uma compreensão de quais políticas e de quem representa esse povo. É, que vai na contramão do viés da violência, da opressão, do silenciamento, de tudo isso que Jair Messias Bolsonaro é, representa. A Rocinha também, né, dado tudo isso, a Rocinha também é uma das favelas que tem o maior índice de tuberculose. Além de estar entre os dois bairros nobres do Rio de Janeiro, Gávea e São Conrado. Isso também tem um outro reflexo, né, de que lugar é esse? Qual é, quando a gente fala de Rocinha, quando a gente fala de favela, onde ela está geograficamente localizada, é muito importante também perceber como as políticas são inclinadas e como as coisas são construídas. À medida em que a gente discute favela e política, há uma dimensão e há diversas camadas de se perceber. Raça, gênero e território que compõem as especificidades desses espaços. É, além de ser um dos territórios mais pesquisados do Brasil, a Rocinha está sempre sendo fonte de estudos das mais diversas academias. Para poder, Eu mesmo já participei de diversas entrevistas e grupos de pesquisa para pensar não só a subjetividade, né, as humanidades dos moradores, mas também pensar as tecnologias que esses espaços produzem. Muito interessante a gente pensar, sobretudo quando a gente fala sobre como ficou, é, qual é a percepção né, a dos moradores. É claro que é, muita, é muito difícil a gente chegar num senso comum, né, muito daquilo pela, pela composição mesmo do território, são muitas pessoas, então há, há muitas variações de interpretação sobre o governo. Na Rocinha eu pude conviver, não só na Rocinha, como também em outras favelas e outros territórios periféricos que eu circulo pela cidade do Rio de Janeiro. É muito, é muito interessante a gente perceber que o governo bolsonarista, ele, ele reflete, ele, de certa maneira, ele mostrou uma camada da sociedade brasileira que estava é, escondida, né? estava precisando dessa liderança para emergir. E como toda grande, e aí se a gente for acompanhar a história do mundo, desde que o mundo é mundo, Todas as grandes guerras e manipulações precisou de uma camada a ser manipulada. Eu, tenho, eu parto muito desse lugar. Acho que tem sempre uma tendência a imaginar que dentro da favela é na favela que se tem a concentração dos bolsonaristas. Eu tenho um pouco de dificuldade com essa afirmação. Eu imagino que dentro, dentro da favela é um espaço com maior possibilidade de manipulação muito porque é nesses espaços que se tem as maiores carências e deficiências de políticas públicas. E isso resulta numa série de manipulações, sobretudo numa manipulação daquilo que são políticas que representam e que são importantes. O governo Bolsonaro, ele reforça o medo, né? O medo do retorno à miséria para os mais pobres, como eu costumo dizer, e a morte para os mais miseráveis. Para mim, isso é... É um clássico sintoma do que é o governo bolsonarista. É preciso entender, sobretudo, que dentro dos territórios marginalizados há variações socioeconômicas, né? A combinação ali de classes dentro da Rocinha você vai encontrar desde o mais miserável a um grande empresário, por exemplo. E essas variações que, inclusive, há uma certa... É uma é a afirmação complexa né, do ponto de vista de se imaginar que os territórios de favela são territórios massivamente empobrecidos, em que a maioria das pessoas estão em extrema vulnerabilidade social, é preciso a gente fazer um exercício ali da nossa imaginação, inclusive sobre o nosso próprio entendimento do que é a pobreza, do que é a pobreza nesses espaços. Acho que... É... Dentro, né, eu acredito que dentro de tudo que o governo Bolsonaro produziu, ele produziu, inclusive, uma reflexão profunda sobre como a gente deve ficar atento às variações né, de, e manipulações que acontecem num governo ditador como esse. E não seria diferente quando você tem um, um, um território é, favelado ou marginalizado, que ele é, em sua medida, dominado pelo poder paralelo, que faz ali uma 
que, que vive sobre dois domínios, né? sobre o domínio do poder público e sobre o domínio do poder paralelo, como que isso se alinha e se comunica ao governo Jair Messias Bolsonaro. Acho que é importante também a gente pensar em como o governo bolsonarista fortaleceu e fortalece é, questões como essa. Bom, e daí eu acho que a fome e o desemprego, como marcaram muito o último, o último governo, né? sobretudo esse governo do Jair Messias Bolsonaro, enquanto o governo do Lula representa o oposto para essa população. O governo do Lula ele representa é, comida na mesa, políticas habitacionais importantes, investimento em saúde, educação, que mobilizou toda uma camada da sociedade, especialmente os favelados e os mais pobres. É a partir do governo Lula que a minha família sai da linha da miséria, caminha para a família pobre e que acende para uma família de classe média. Então, esse vetor, esse deslocamento social e econômico que o governo do Lula representa não teve continuidade durante o governo Bolsonaro. Acho que a gente, e ainda digo mais, esses territórios eles são ocupados, em sua maioria, por pessoas pretas. Né? E quando a gente fala sobre isso, é muito importante a gente perceber que os governos eles precisam partir de um pressuposto antirracista. À medida em que a gente constrói políticas públicas, essas políticas públicas elas precisam ser antirracistas, antirracistas, machistas também. Elas precisam caminhar com a lógica do bem viver. E para a favela ficou nítido quando a favela expressa nas urnas que 70% do voto que ela acredita, 70% daquilo que ela deposita enquanto política de representação, porque política de representatividade ainda é um ponto que a gente precisa discutir, mas uma política de representação que se aproxima do sentimento favelado é a política de Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, aquele que de fato traz a, a verdadeira expressão de esperança e de um novo lugar. Então, para a gente poder trazer para perto, né, o clima, gente, tinha tantos fogos no dia que o Lula, no domingo, o que era aquela rocinha? Parecia jogo do Flamengo, que é o maior... Assim, eu sou vascaína, mas tinha, é um dos maiores times de, de futebol daqui do do Brasil, mas é, o, 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 a Rocinha estava em festa e pulando, todo mundo gritando uma grande celebração é um governo de celebração, é um governo de esperança Thank you so much, Magda um, I would like to um, ask Mariana the next question um, you said that the victory of Lula um, on both the first round and the second round, but the most significant in the second round was the victory of poverty over wealth. Um, however, as Melissa mentioned, he also won by a very thin margin, both in the first round, a little bit bigger, about 5%, and the second round, less than 2%, which means that in the second round, at least, Bolsonaro got 58 million votes. Uh, seven more million than he gathered in the first round. So we also saw this week uh, images of roadblocks and demonstrations, which you referred to, um, and that lived through actually trying to uh, get here. Um, um, if, and even uh, demonstrations, popular demonstrations, popular demonstrations in front of military buildings, asking the military, or their Bolsonaro supporters, asking the military to intervene. Um, for those of us who um, still remember military dictatorships in Latin America, this is a very, very scary um, image. Um, so in your presentation, you refer to the importance of the national conferences um, as one of the examples of participatory democracy, which was so important, um, at least in the first decade of this century, um, and for which Brazil was really a model for the rest of the world, right? Here we are, you know, another decade later, with a big part of the population knocking at the doors of the cuarteles, as we say in Spanish, you know, asking them to step in. So, Given that contradiction between you know the recent past and the and the present, um, how do you assess 
the current situation of democracy in Brazil? And what are your hopes, perhaps, if not prognosis, for the near future? Well, this is a difficult question to answer. I wish I could speak like Lisa. <laughs> she, she's so brilliant in Spain. All the history of how this thing happened. I'm just a writer of fiction. Sometimes I feel like I, I have no answers. I have no perspective, no, no anything. But anyway, uh, we Brazilians at this moment, I think we do not need to be experts in the subject of what Lula means, what this election means to us. And my hope is that, as usually happens in Brazil in politics, we have uh, in the Congress uh, uh, what we call Centrão, which is the big center, I'm translating it, as a, the big center, uh, which uh, includes lots, uh, I don't know how many, but anyway, the majority of the Brazilian politics, conservative politics, of, they are not exactly of the right wing and not of the left wing, they are in the center, as it's so. And they, they just, uh, let themselves be bought by whoever is in the government. So, be bought with money, of course. And so, my hope again is that Lula is a brilliant strategist. Uh, he's so brilliant in making coalitions. Of course, people in the left wing do not like that very much <laughs> because you have, you have to join with people which are not really the ones, the ideal ones to to make a, a a clean administration without corruption but th that's what we have right now so i think this is going to happen it's already happening so and even Lula's vice 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 president which is alchemy which was the which is the man of, of the center which was, he was the governor of sao paulo two or three times um, and the, the, the leftist parties do not like him, but we, we had to accept him, I think, because I'm a, uh, a petista, as they say, of the Workers' Party. So, Lula was very, I would say, smart, I don't know for what word to use, when he chose uh, Alchemy as his vice president. Alchemy is now. Finally, I think yesterday he was recognized, officially recognized by, by Bolsonaro's government to be the man who's making the transition in government. So um, I love to, to hear Martha, Martha's explanation of Bosnia, Bosnia, describe it. So, you know, I don't know. I, I know there are Brazilian people here who know what a favela is, but it's really the extreme situation of poverty in Brazil and black people is the majority. So I don't know if I answered your question. Sometimes I'm very confused about this, this, this thing, but so, uh, <laughs> I wish I could be here speaking about literature. I, I would be more at ease, but this is my main um, activity anyway. I don't know if I answered the question, but this is what I did, more or less what I did. Right? Yeah, thank you so much, um, Marilene. Um, yes, absolutely you answered my question. And in fact, you know, there will be opportunity to talk about literature as well during this month. So don't, don't worry, we'll, we'll be sure to engage you in those as well. Um, but we've learned a lot already from you um, and your presentation here. So um, I, I hope you will really um, know that. Um, Melissa, um, my my last question uh, for you is um, precisely touching upon these issues that uh, Marilene was uh, talking about about the coalition that is necessary together to rule Brazil starting January first. Um, you know what um, what what are the characteristics of that ruling coalition, um, and do you have any thoughts or do you anticipate 
what the relationship with Congress, with the governors, and with the mayors may be like, like in the in the next four years. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, that is an important question. I think it's also a big question mark. Uh, I mean, I would really echo what Marilani said in the sense that Lula, I mean, he has I mean, in many ways, he is a kind of once in a generation type of politician because he has both, I, I think many would attest to his genuine charisma, his genuine empathy, and his genuine connection with Brazilians, especially Brazilians who did not see themselves reflected in the political system that had been dominated by elites uh, and that Lula's trajectory as somebody who came from a working class background in the Northeast and kind of ascended into the highest ranks of national and international politics. I mean, it's quite remarkable. And yet he maintains that really direct personalist, uh, affectionate connection with the people, I think is really remarkable. At the same time, he is a very savvy political operator. Um, and he understands what's required of him in order to build those coalitions. And so thinking back to 2002, um, you know, that was the fourth time that Lula had run for the presidency. He had lost the previous three times. And that fourth time, he really made an effort both in his campaign and then upon his election to bring in uh, free market or kind of liberal uh, economic voices into his governing coalition, his choice of the president of the central bank, for example, and his um, willingness to work with the IMF in that moment, right, especially because Brazil, Argentina, they had found themselves in a bit of a crisis there. So he's somebody who maintains his ideological commitments, uh, somebody who maintains his commitments to being um, the voice of marginalized poor uh, populations in Brazil, but also who knows how to build coalitions and in many ways um, we've already seen that with his choice of Alpine as, as vice president, which I, I myself was also really surprised <laughs> by um, when kind of those rumors started about a year ago. Um, I do think, you know, I think this is one of the big questions as to, in some ways, Alpine is a choice that is, it's almost in many ways very much a 2002 choice uh, because of Alpine's place both as former governor of Sao Paulo, but also as kind of former leader of PSDB, the center-right party in Brazil. Uh, and that center-right party is pretty much defunct right now. Um, I mean, in terms of its losses in this past presidential election. And even, and I would be curious to hear um, what Marilene or Armando maybe would have to say about the role of PSDB, which uh, is the kind of party that has really led that Centrão bloc uh, in Congress. I think it's a question mark as to whether or not those traditional parties of opposition to the PT, to the Workers' Party, are going to maintain their position of power and opposition, or whether Bolsonaro's party or Bolsonaro's allies have managed to turn their kind of that kind of popular resent the sentiments of popular resentment and kind of that rhetoric of violence into not just the political movement, um, but also into institution kind of political institutions. Um, I think, you know, we saw Bolsonaro's allies make important gains in the governorships uh, and in Congress, uh, which means that Lula will have uh, a pretty significant block of opposition whether or not he'll be able to, as he has in the past, to bring those um, parties into, into his camp, I think remains to be seen. He's very good uh, at making compromises and, and kind of bringing together these diverse coalitions. And he's already signaled that with his cabinet, you know, he will have, um, he will create spaces for people who, uh, as Marilene said, you know, maybe his left, uh, left his base would not really be happy with. Um, but I also think that Bolsonaro is, uh, and, and that faction, is quite militantly opposed to the PT and everything that it stands for. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we'll see. We'll have to wait and see. Um, and I think this is also something that Marilene brought up, which I think is important to mention, that I think for a while, one of my 
doubts about Bolsonaro was whether or not he was actually able to shift the nature of institutions in Brazil, kind of to engage with the state in a way in which I think Lula was really effective at coming, you know, especially from a tradition that I think starts with Chitilio Vargas in the 1930s, and actually shaping the way in which the state functions beyond politics and thinking about institutions. Um, and I think in some ways with the kind of support that Bolsonaro has, especially among the military and the police forces, he has actually been able to kind of penetrate the state kind of beyond its kind of political or kind of outward facing, facing components. And so I think that'll also be something that Lula has to contend with. Um, Thank you. Okay, we'll open up to the floor. There is um, a microphone that is going to circulate so um, our interpreters can hear and translate your questions back into Portuguese. Yeah, first we'll do the room and if we have time, we'll do the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much for everybody's presentation. Uh, we all learned a lot. Uh, I was wondering, um, two questions and then everybody who feels compelled to answer can, can do so. Uh, so, uh, thinking about this new uh, far right movements in Brazil, uh, what do you think is the relationship between racism as in the ways it constitutes those movements and fuels the how extreme they are right now? Um, and the other question is, what do you think is the late? We hear it being talked a lot about how the the, the victory was razor thin. Um, but at the same time, just recently there was a, a Kaku sales, I think, with the, the, the journalist. He just did a, 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 he just did this uh, this work where he shows how you know small municipalities are are are, are were, uh, were trying to like buy votes systemically, systematically trying to buy votes and scare. Uh, uh, the population to vote for Bolsonaro. So, like, what do you think is the kind of labor we're going to do to figure out the, the, the extent to which they attempt to steal these elections, and how how and how much like it wouldn't be razor thin had it had it not been conducted in that way? Thank you. Oh yes, that's right. Racism and right movement in Brazil. Yeah, <coughs> and the right movement. Ah, okay. in Brazil. I can briefly answer the, the question about racism and the other one maybe Mario or Mario or uh, I just have to point out about racism in Brazil that uh, there is a a big shift in this in this question nowadays from my from the time I was young. For example. I am. I was born in, in Pernambuco, the same state as Lula was born. My family uh, had to immigrate to São Paulo in the year in 1969. I was 10 years old, 10 to 11 years old, and uh, Lula's family immigrated uh, from the same state 20 years before, almost 20 years before, also to São Paulo. So, and we did that not to die of hunger. Not we starved, so my my parents had to move to Sao Paulo to because they uh, they could have better conditions of survival. So this is what, uh, what point. So my life, my 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 personal life, my I personally had to first survive hunger, not crazy. This is very clear for me. I am now sixty four years old, but my nephews who are nowadays. 30 years old, or even younger people in Brazil, they are responsible for the enormous shift in combating racism nowadays in Brazil. It's completely different from my time. So, they are radical uh, militants on the on the black cause, on the on the on combating racism, and it, this is very beautiful. I, I'm even uh, shocked sometimes at the position they assume about that in Brazil. For example, one of my nephews does not date white women anymore. He had two two girlfriends who were white, but suddenly he, he gave up. He, he, he doesn't. And this for me is is a little bit strange, but I have I have I have boyfriends, uh, white, black, and so. 
but he's he's really he, he's against me in that point because I understand what he does, and this is very important. So um, a girl I might like Magda, for example, this is this is astonishing, beautiful for me that nowadays this is this is a big shit. So this is uh, this is what, what that is happening now is different from my uh, trajectory because of that. Because first of all, and, and nowadays uh, because they 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 join together with this black youth, they, they are more strong. They're stronger than I was in my time. The, all my group of people that I was contact with, I had to work since I was 19 years, uh, uh, 14 years old to eat. And so I had to to break barriers of racism. I, I did not even pay much attention. I, I knew I was discriminated, that there was racism and so on. The places where I went, at the university where I studied, which is the biggest university, the most important in Latin America, the University of Sao Paulo. But I didn't care about that. I just broke barriers. That way I have to eat, I have to have my, my family. So I was going to say, <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I, I, I wonder if we could um, hear Magda address this question of uh, racism and the right uh, movement in Brazil. Claro. É, tem uma 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 dinâmica social aqui que eu percebo que ela é muito ela é muito sofisticada, né? À medida em que o tempo vai passando, o racismo ele vai se sofisticando, porque não há um enfrentamento global na questão do racismo. Acho que é o primeiro ponto. Para a gente erradicar o racismo na sociedade, ele tem que ser uma prioridade da sociedade. A prioridade da sociedade, o mundo, a globalização é discutir quem é que vai dominar, quem vai ser a principal potência ou destaque econômico. Mas, nesse mesmo lugar, não se tem um alinhamento para fazer a erradicação do racismo. O primeiro passo, na minha concepção, é a gente observar a que nível o combate ao racismo está dado frente ao mundo. Essa é um, eu acho que isso é um exercício coletivo. Voltando e vindo para cá, para o Brasil, acompanhando muito os, os movimentos como eles se organizam aqui no Brasil, sobretudo o movimento negro unificado, como o movimento negro unificado, que é um dos maiores movimentos negros do Brasil, faz o enfrentamento e o combate ao racismo. Primeiro, a gente precisa atravessar e aí a palavra atravessar, ela pode nos remeter, e aí, flertando muito com a literatura, viu? Porque é, a literatura nos salva e nos preenche nos momentos de, de angústia, como é bom ler Bell Hooks, Angela Davis, Lélia Gonzalez e Maria Car Carolina Maria de Jesus para compreender o quanto que as lutas de hoje foram e são lutas de ontem, e que elas não devem ser lutas de amanhã. Então, assim, o enfrentamento do racismo, sobretudo aqui no Brasil, é quando uh, a todo tempo, não importa em qual classe social, qual classe econômica eu estou, quais espaços eu ocupo, a cor da minha pele ainda causa estranhamento. O enfrentamento no, do racismo no Brasil é quando a política, de forma sofisticada, se organiza para proteger quem é que vai representar. Tem uma sofisticação, não tem uma preocupação em acabar com o racismo. Como, por exemplo, e aí eu não quero colocar aqui de forma sobreposta, né? uma coisa não é mais importante que a outra. Essas coisas, inclusive, precisam caminhar juntas, que é, por exemplo, o enfrentamento às mudanças climáticas. Eu queria muito que o racismo mobilizasse o mundo como outras coisas mobilizam infelizmente, não mobiliza. No Brasil, o que mobiliza a se discutir o racismo é quando você tem casos catastróficos, quando alguém é terrivelmente assassinado, quando alguém é terrivelmente constrangido, aí a gente fala sobre o racismo. 
fora isso, o racismo é como se fosse algo inexistente. Até porque, por muito tempo, a gente viveu e sobreviveu sob o mito da democracia racial. Um país como esse, que tem no seu histórico de fundação 500 anos de escravidão, de estupro, de violência, né? violência de, de roubo, de, das coisas mais bizarras, ah, essas maluquices, é, não tem como esse país se recuperar em 200 ou 150 anos se a gente não fizer um enfrentamento sério do racismo. E isso só vai passar quando o racismo for uma prioridade global. A gente precisa dizer que a gente não tolera mais, a gente não negocia mais, e de onde eu estou, eu não irei retroceder. Se eu cheguei até aqui, sendo eu, uma mulher preta, favelada, que nasce em um território é, periférico, filha de pessoas pobres, e eu vou para um outro lugar no mundo, eu vou daqui para frente, daqui para mais. E onde eu estou, cabe mais. Por exemplo, isso que a gente faz dentro do Instituto Gueto, quando a gente entende que é através das línguas e linguagens que a gente vai ampliar é, e fazer com que haja um encontro global entre pessoas negras por todo o mundo, em que a gente se apoie, compreenda as nossas necessidades e, sobretudo, fazendo um diálogo com aqueles que entendam que a luta antirracista é uma luta prioritária para que a gente consiga viver em um mundo... É, igualitário para todos. E aí, fechando e fazendo uma linha com a política, enquanto houver racismo, não haverá democracia. A democracia ela é um instrumento fundamental para a gente fazer a manutenção da sociedade, para a gente disputar a sociedade. O que está que no imaginário social e coletivo? O que está que lá na frente? E o que está lá na frente só vai fazer sentido se pessoas pretas fizerem parte da construção e da estruturação desse imaginário social coletivo. This man in power in Brazil, I think, amassed the myth of non violence in Brazilian society. This is an important question, I think. Um, perhaps, uh, once and for all, I guess, has unmasked uh, what Marina Shawi, including, uh, describes as the Brazilian mythical self image of a peaceful, of a peaceful people, happy, cordial welcoming, mestizo, incapable of, of uh, ethical discrimination, an owner of the black swing in football, and the body of the sexy mulata. So, Bolsonaro's government has revealed this, uh, that this is, uh, has unmasked this myth of nonviolence in our society. And we have also to remember that the impeachment of President ex-president Dilma Rousseff, which was uh, a coup, a coup led by the, the civil, civil, juridical, and media sectors of the society, uh, created this, uh, this environment, this uh, very favorable environment in Brazil for the far right wing to be there as it was for four years. So, I guess uh, previous governments of Lula and even Dilma failed in two aspects, in my opinion. One of them was um, they, have, they should have created a security policy that would combat death and mass incarceration of, of poor and black populations in Brazil, which is not, which was not unfortunately. Um, They, their governments could not, could not, uh, they failed in doing that. And they also failed, in my opinion, and that's, uh, uh, and I'm saying this because of this, uh, of the Dilma's impeachment, they failed creating a media uh, uh, regulation, as it was partially done in Argentina, for example, by uh, Kishner, Christian Kishner, to combat the monopoly of information 
in the hands of about four or five large media conglomerates in Brazil. This is very difficult to be done because you have to fight against big, big people. But they should have started it at least, and this did not happen. Okay. Well, um, there are many questions in the room, uh, but we are really against the hour. Um, so um, I wonder if we could just um, gather over food and continue the conversation. Um, I think we probably can be here until two. Um, so, so just, you know, linger um, and uh, grab some food and continue the conversation that, that way. I apologize, I have to um, end here. But thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you to all of you for coming. And sorry we didn't have more time for questions.